Max. I'm Kevin. And uh, we have something special here. We are going to be doing a series within the six pattern video. And the series is about uh, the top 25 pearls of pulmonary pathology. Because you see, when you receive a whole bunch of consultations over a period of several years, you begin to learn exactly what the challenge is that people are facing with various specimens. And so we developed these top 25 pearls to really help you as the practicing pathologist to avoid stepping into that pearl right. and making that mistake. Right. So this first one, what's our history for this first one, Kevin? We've got a 48-year-old man who comes to transbronchial biopsy, and uh, we don't get any more history than that. Well, that's all the history I ever get with my cases of transbronchial biopsy, they never have any history to them. Or sometimes they say, rule out tumor, <laughs> when they really didn't mean it, when they... or rule out IPF, when they didn't mean it. So there's some automatics that get in here that can be confusing, but we're pathologists and we're, you know, grounded in morphology, so we can look at the biopsy without any history, right? Absolutely. We, we can make a diagnosis without any history. It might not be right, but we can make a diagnosis. Right. Okay, so I'm looking at this and I'm seeing a transbronchial biopsy, and this is a great transbronchial biopsy, right? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. we have tons of fragments of tissue. This is a generous transbronchial biopsy. Yeah. Now, we know it's a transbronchial biopsy because we have a lot of blood here. Right. And what does the blood mean as opposed to other types of transbronchial sampling? Well, there are a bunch of interesting messages when you see blood in a transbronchial biopsy. Now, we're... We're saying this in the context of a parenchymal biopsy, not bronchial mucosa. But when you've got lung parenchyma and it's full of blood, and you've got more than one sample, it's likely that if there's two biopsies, one of them won't have blood, and the other will. Like that one. And that tells us something about what the pulmonologist was doing, because this means they went back to the same segment twice. The first time they did a biopsy, the patient bled. No blood in the biopsy yet. Now they go back to the same area of the lung. They biopsy full of fresh blood. Fresh blood. Not hemocytorin laden macrophages. Right. Not diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. But we're talking about fresh blood. Right. And it's not uniform. We've got one with, one without, another one over here. Doesn't have much, if any. So they may have gone to a couple of segments because we've got one bloody. They went back to one place twice for sure. Exactly. So generous biopsy, the other way that we know that it's a transbronchial biopsy, right, is that we have these areas of pinch where the biopsy forceps have pinched and crushed the tissue around the, uh, from the biopsy technique. And you're saying that, Max, because it's, you're con contrasting this to another form of biopsy. What are you thinking of? Like a cryobiopsy? Cryobiopsy, no forceps involved. Exactly. You know, if you don't think about that, why would you think that there'd be no for forceps with a cryobiopsy? It's because the technique doesn't require you to pinch the tissue. You're actually freezing the tissue in place and pulling a ball of ice out of the lung. Right. And we're going to do a whole video on the cryobiopsy. Oh, no doubt. Wait for that one. So, transbronchial biopsy, multiple generous fragments. We know it's a transbronchial biopsy. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking... Well, at first I'm nervous because my pulmonologist always wants a diagnosis when they send me a transbronchial biopsy. Especially if they actually got parenchyma. You know, most of the time you're telling them, unfortunately, it's just bronchial mucosa. I'd love to help you. I could help you if but only we, you gave me some lung parenchyma. But we just and can't. Here they, they gave us a ton of lung parenchyma, so we are under the gun to come up with a fantastic, brilliant diagnosis. Exactly. I hope you guys are going to help us. So I search around real carefully, and I see some areas of fibrin like this, and then I see some very focal areas like this uh -huh. where I say, wow, that yes. looks like a polyp of organizing pneumonia. So a tiny little microscopic dot There's of another. repair. Uh, uh, two. Two <laughs> microscopic <laughs> dots of repair. Right. But there's no doubt they're real. They are there. So, so yeah. I go to the textbook. And I look up organizing pneumonia, and the first interstitial lung disease described in the setting of organizing pneumonia is cryptogenic, cryptogenic organizing, pneumonia. organizing pneumonia. 
We call it COP. All right. But formerly you're known to... as Boop. And you before that, known cops. as <laughs> you, you want <laughs> <Bip. Bip. laughs> Yeah. So it, it's a lot of fun. Pulmonary pathology is a lot of fun with the terminology. It's like like the people who made up those terms. I'm wondering, could they be aliens? <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> I mean, from another planet. So because they're totally made up and fictitious. They are, they are completely made up. They don't mean anything right. really. Right. Okay, so we're seeing this. We got a transbronch. We're feeling pressure from the pulmonologist. We say, I'm seeing some polyps of organizing pneumonia. Maybe this is cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. Yeah. What should I do as a pathologist, though, on any case that shows organizing pneumonia? Well, first of all, as Max said, you look in the book and you've got polyps of organization, you've got some fibrin. That is acute and organizing lung injury. That's the generic broad stroke. Every case where you see those findings, you have to do special stains for organisms. I generally do AFB and GMS. I do them, uh, they're like a, like a pair. They're like a pair. They're like a couple. Now, if you just do the GMS, I promise you, the ID person will call back and say, is your AFB broken? <laughs> What's wrong with the AFB? What's wrong? Why didn't you do it? And I'm like, because it's you? not going to be positive. They say, please just do it for me. So getting away from that problem, I do it up front. Okay. So you've done the AFB and GMS. And presumably they're negative. They're always negative. In this context. Almost always negative. Because there's context. no necrosis here. Right. And we know that in another video, we're going to talk about necrosis. That's another in pearl. The import. It's another That's pearl. another pearl. Okay. So transbronch, a little bit of organizing pneumonia. Right. Wanting to call it cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. We've done our special stains. They're negative. And so we sign it out as possibly cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, but I feel badly signing it out because I know my pulmonologist wants more. So we send it out for consultation. Right. Right. And what do you think the consultant's going to say here? Well, I think the consultant's going to agree entirely with what's been described so far. Yeah. There's a little bit of organizing pneumonia here. There's a little bit of fibrin here, but we can't get anywhere close to diagnosing cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. First of all, pathologists can't diagnose cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, right? So ever. you want to say, don't ever do it because it's not in our wheelhouse. That's right. A cryptogenic clinical disease is one that has to be investigated clinically. All we can do is describe the findings and then let the clinician figure that out. And more importantly, any consultant on a case like this is going to say, well, I guess it could be an ILD. The findings are pretty subtle. Of course. What is the x-ray show what does the ct show is the patient sick because if this is truly an injury and it's diffuse in the lung the patient's going to be sick maybe shorter breath the patient should be very sick i mean we have fibrin we have organizing this right. is an acute lung injury process right right so that's the question they're going to ask you so don't send the case without finding out that in fact which we did find out in this case the patient has a mass a mass. Two centimeter mass lesion. So the pulmonologist was trying to use the bronchoscope to get a biopsy of the cancer. Ran into this as a total sidebar. So when you come back and call it COP, your pulmonologist is going to really wonder whether or not the case might have gotten mixed up in the lab. And <laughs> you would hope that that would be their first thought, yeah. that the case got mixed up. But the reality is their first thought is, this, guy, this person's out to lunch. They don't know what they're doing. Yeah. Right. Even though you've yeah. interpreted it absolutely perfectly. Oh, yeah. You were accurate. You just took it a step too far right. without having the clinical and the radiologic correlation. So what's an important aspect of the transbronchial biopsy, and it gets to our pearl of transbronchial biopsy, is that you should resist the urge to diagnose interstitial lung disease in the setting of a transbronchial biopsy. Because it, particularly if you don't have clinical information. Right. Absolutely if you don't. Yeah. Now, if you see a granuloma, if, if there was a little tiny history. granuloma in here and you diagnosed chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, that would be a mistake. So none of the findings you see in the transbronch, there are occasions where you can find something like a focus of lamb and it is diagnostic on its own. Or sarcoidosis. Or granulomas of characteristic sarcoid. Yes. But with these more generic findings, they have to be in the right context. So resist the urge without good clinical information and CT radiologic 
information. Exactly. And a bit of very helpful information, at least it is for me in my practice, is that it's the 70-30 rule, yeah. right? When you're talking about interstitial lung disease and you're talking about transbronchial biopsy, right? 70% of your transbronchial biopsies for interstitial lung disease will be non-diagnostic in the setting of an immunocompetent patient. Correct. Right? So think about that for a minute. Seven 70%. Out ten. So 7 out of 10. Will be non-diagnostic. And you're feeling guilty as a pathologist, but if the patient is, has a normal immune system, most of the time the transbronch is not going to add helpful information. On the other side, 70% of patients who are immunocompromised will actually have findings that are helpful. So knowing the immune status of the host is one of the critical findings that you need to apply in your own practice. Very important. Okay. So transbronchial biopsy, the first pearl in the series of pulmonary pathology, resists the urge to, di to diagnose interstitial lung disease in the setting of a transbronchial biopsy, even though your pulmonologist will be pushing you for it. Okay, that does it for uh, this pearl. We hope you enjoyed the six patterns video. Don't forget to like and comment below and uh, let us know what else you might be interested in seeing. Stay tuned.